Hi, hi, dear listeners. Welcome to the episode four of Thinking Psychologist. In in episode one, we saw how our human mind is deceiving us, and we are being tortured by our mind. Episode two with uh, Rob Sutcliffe was about uh, you know how how we don't even think in a rational way. It's all emotional decision making that we do. And in episode three, uh, Frisia Jackson told us about how to get into the state of flow really, really fast. Today's topic of discussion, which is episode four, we have a fantastic guest who is a clinical psychologist from Hong Kong, and uh, she is an expert trainer in mindfulness meditation. And in today's uh, discussion, we want to explore more about this top topic about mindfulness-based stress reduction and topics of how mindfulness is changing the world out there, and there's a revolution going on. With that in perspective, with, with, without further ado, let's invite Beatrice on the show. Beatrice, welcome to Thinking Psychologist. Hi, welcome. Thank you, Ash. So, Beatrice, you know, could you give us a, a little bit of your background and you know what what, oh, what brings sorry. you to uh, you know? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. You know, what what I'm what got you interested in psychology and a little bit of your background for our audience, please? Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a registered clinical psychologist in Hong Kong. Actually, before I become a psychologist, I was a reporter, mm-hmm. and then I go back to study. So I and I earn my second degree, and I go back to become a clinical psychologist. And um, I was trained in um, the Canada, the Center of Mindfulness Study. So I'm certified there, and um, I have also finished the foundation course with Oxford Mindfulness Center. So uh, after that, I have I have go on to different certificate on um, on mindfulness, like um, training kids with ADHD and ASD, and mindful parenting, and mindfulness for cancer patients. Um, mm-hmm. I just recently finished like the trauma sensitive mindfulness course online. So yeah, I'm I'm very into mindfulness myself. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What yeah. what got you interested into mindfulness, if may I ask? What what make us what make me into mindfulness? I think like uh, a few years ago, back into I think when is that six six maybe yeah when I was first in touch with MBCT, which now I'm teaching MBCT right now. So mm-hmm. before I become a teacher, I go for the eight week class myself with two psychologists in Hong Kong, and I feel so different after the class. I feel the transformation myself. Like how I understand myself better, how how much I have more pause in my life, so mm-hmm. I can take care of myself in different moments when I make decisions. Um, I find it so important for emotional regulation myself. So I'm I'm really moved, and then I seek for the teacher training in Canada. So uh-huh. that's how everything starts. So you know, coming to this topic of MBCT. You know, so you know we we have in psychologists generally talk about RBET, where you know the thoughts, feelings, and actions, and thoughts and feelings always match. What what makes mindfulness based CT and you know RBCT a, a different roles altogether? What makes mindfulness thing uh, different from a clinical uh, CT? Ah, you mean how mindfulness is different from our clinical work? Yes, please. Yeah. I think the key difference, to be honest, because I'm I have these two role, these two hat in my in my head at the same time. I think the key difference is when we are teaching mindfulness, we are trying to be present. We are not trying to fix another person. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not having that. I I don't even have a sense of I'm helping that person. You know, I'm sharing. In, mm-hmm. in, at the same time, I'm practicing with them. You know, so this is a journey that both of us are walking together. I'm right. there, so I'm being present. That what what is my offering is my presence there, and that is very different from you know in clinical work that people coming to seek help. They are really seeking. There's something that they want to change, and we are really in a more guiding role, trying to fix some of the problem. Mm-hmm. That's very different. Ah, okay. So you know, once you talk about being more aware about you know um i am i'm sitting here i am aware about my surroundings and everything what is this what is this awareness that we are talking about here you mean what is the self awareness that i'm talking about yes. right here like um 
like I'm aware of. I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. So I'm not just aware of things in my mind that I want to say. Like I'm feeling. I have some anxiety here. Now I'm talking because I know mm-hmm. the video is recording, right? So I have some anxiety at the same time. Um, and I'm aware my feet is on the floor when I'm sitting. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty ground. I'm pretty safe. Right. <laughs> at the same time, right? My mind is running. So that that's the whole package of experience that I'm having mm. at the moment. If I take over some piece to talk about, right? And being self-aware is like um, you you know you know the priority from moment to moment. I sometimes really feel in that sense. Um, I have recall one experience when I was working in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I was working in a palliative ward. So it's people are dying. And I'm serving in that ward at the time. Uh, and I, I have finished that mindfulness class for a few years already. And I was asked to go into a single room, which means someone is dying there very close right. within days or even hours, anytime. So I have to go inside because the doctor referred me to see his wife. They worry about the grief of his wife. So before I go in, first thing in my mind is, why you don't even refer me earlier? Mm-hmm. You know, that person is dying. I just <laughs> have to know the wife and I'm going to support her for something. So it's a very intimate journey, you mm-hmm. know, about grieving your husband, right? And I'm just coming out of the blue in her life. Right. So first, I have anxiety right there. Okay, and I go in. And then I see people surrounding the bed, very sad, but doing nothing because no, nothing you can do when right. someone is yeah. so close to dying. So he is in a coma already, the husband. So I'm trying to manage to talk to the wife a little bit. And then suddenly he passed away, yes. just in front of my eyes. And that is also the first time that I see someone die in front of me. So close. So for me, it's actually quite a shocking experience too. But at the same time, I'm not in a position to just take care of myself. I'm supposed to come to work. And that very moment, I still remember that I quickly, the first thing I do is I feel my feet standing. And then I take a deep breath. And then the third moment, I'm like, okay, what I need to do right now. And the whole room is crying like crazy loud. They are speaking in their dialect because they're coming from China. So I don't know what they're talking about, but they keep talking, crying, very regularly, very dramatically. I'm actually surprised because everyone knows that he's dying. So it's not a sudden death, right? Everyone knows. But he, they are crying so, so badly, that um, so dramatic that I am actually a bit shocked. So at that moment, I decide I take away the kids to wait outside because the kids is like, what is happening right there is shaking the room. So I take the kids away outside of it, settling them, telling them this is what's happening. So doing a little psychoeducation. With all my shocking inside, you know, <laughs> my feet are still on the floor, but I'm so shocked inside. I'm like, oh my God. So I'm working at the same time. And then later I can come in. I still remember the nurse come in uh, because there's a palliative care ward. So the nurse is basically able to differentiate, you know, like, oh, this is, we need to certify, just call the doctor, sign the document, you know, because it's palliative work already. So they're very well trained. So the nurse come in and then go out. They come, they come in quickly, go out, tell me that, okay, I leave it to you. Because they're <laughs> so messy. You know, no one wants to stay close to grief, right? right? Yes, no one wants so to stay close. No one, no one knows what to do. Yeah. And... Um, so, okay, so I'm the only professional inside. And then, and then later, you know, finally I managed to talk to the wife a little bit. So she's little crying and so, and then she explained to me that this is their tradition to be so dramatic inside. You have to yes. cry out loud, you have to speak like, you have to speak like you just know the news and that is what is expected. So that's the ritual. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Because mm-hmm. so I'm like, yeah. It's, in fact, my, I still remember how I witnessed that guy pass away. It's like from a moment to the next moment. Totally peaceful. You know, here he's breathing. Next moment, he's dead. Nothing else. You know, oh. that's it. 
Yeah. But the, the death is peaceful, but the people surrounding him mm. uh, wasn't. So that's a very profound experience for me. It's still like when I'm now talking about it, I can still feel that anxiety Good bump, maybe yeah. recover. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad that um, yeah, I, I'm, I can still connect to the wife at that time. Even I'm such a stranger, suddenly come into the room, just know her for a few minutes, and then she's facing that dramatic loss. And so I am yeah. curious, what did you, what did you tell the wife? What do I do with the wife? Yeah, what did you tell her? What did I tell her? I think like what, what more I do is I listen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm seeing if she wants to speak because okay. I, I, I just come to know I don't know her personality you know I don't know what she actually wants at that moment so I'm there and I'm listening and she talked a little bit about explaining what's happening and then she tell me that she wants to change the clothing of her um, of her husband so I, I arranged it for her and I didn't handle it with her it's too intimate but she did yeah, like it so I, I was there, I was assisting. If she need anything, she would come to talk to me and I would sort it out with the hospital for her. After the process, she's much calmer. You know, she can actually do something for her husband, change the clothing, clean his face. She has a little ritual for herself too, I think at that moment. So it's not really like what po- such profound thing that I said. I was there. I think that's the most important thing there with my anxiety. <laughs> I was there with her. Um, yeah, I think that's the that's when I recall right now. I still think that's the best I can do at that right. very moment. So you know uh, what what uh, you know uh, one thing that I get from this story is the the expectation of people who surround you. It's actually much more worrisome as compared to your inner peace, yeah. and it is. It is the it is the world that drives you crazy and not not it's just the inner peace because we want to yeah. conform to the society and we want to you know behave and act like just to please everyone, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does does yeah. mindfulness help us in some way to get away from all that social noise, sort of? Yeah, I, I'm sure you have the experience. Ash, so you pick this up, isn't it, right? You yes. recognize that. Because, yeah, it's so so true that what you just have said, that when you listen to so much noise, or no matter that's the social pressure that you experience with, or like the social anxiety right now for the virus out there, or like mm-hmm. the lots of social norms that is imposing on you, like it or not. And how do you protect your inner peace? At the same time, you can still interact with the world without losing yourself. And mm-hmm. what is the wise decision to make in every moment about this balance, which right. is still dynamic process. And that's so true that I feel mindfulness is cultivating that space inside us to see not just what is outside, but also see yourself inside at the same time. If right. you can hold that landscape in a more peaceful mind, then there would be I think there would be a wiser decision coming up in in some of the moment. I can't say that you know since then we don't we don't make mistake anymore, mm-hmm. or we don't do anything we, we we regret anymore. You know, even the best decision. But still, I I do think that space that mindfulness creates is really important, and that is part of the self awareness that I'm talking about. Um, um, you know, I'd like to just add a point about my personal experience with the meditation now. Uh, sort of, it has, it has changed the way once you slow down the things and you slow down your thought process, uh, there, is a, there is so much calmness in the head. And then, uh, you know, and then sort of I was reading more about Buddhism and stuff and the definition of wisdom came up. So wisdom was all about getting the positive thoughts inside and just letting go of all the negative thoughts. And that sort of was very revealing sort of internally where, you know, all the noises in my head when I realized it's not me, it's it's a different person altogether. That's liberating. (laughs) Yeah, that's liberation, exactly. And it felt sort of, you know, it was not, the liberation was not here, it was sort of in the heart. There was a sort of a calmness and a a feel of very, very liberating feel altogether. Yeah. 
Yeah, and yeah, that's what you just said. How much fault here? And that's not me. That's part. You know, that's part of the whole experience. Exactly. That says that yeah, it's liberating to see. Oh, okay, that's a part. That's not me. Yeah, you, and I have yeah. so much option then. Exactly. So yeah. in in your in your practice, you know, um, once you convey this particular message to your patients as well, do they experience the same? Is is you know, because for me it was you know quite hard that I understood and read a lot of stuff. But how does this message go out to your patients? And do you have certain experience around there? In in my teaching in the MBCT eight week class, very often the student experiences when they are、uh, mind when they go to the meditation we call choice and awareness, which is in section five, which is um, which is a, a meditation that is observing thought.、Mm-hmm. So that that is usually how I see the students have a breakthrough. Like they see they have a new place to stand. When they can see their thoughts instead of engage with the thoughts, instead of going into it, keep analyzing, thinking, answering the thoughts as if this is whole truth, and they now have a way to stand and observe it, and they can even see deeper next time. Then they can see the relationship with the thought, what this thought brings up to me. So the space is like expanding, expanding that non-judgmental awareness. Which is inside their mind, and that's how I that's how I usually see you know in the teaching. It's not from me telling them. So now I'm still have to tell because this is like conversation. But in the class itself, it's actually their own experience. My my job is like I'm trying to ask question to guide them to talk about the experience to make this explicit、uh, explicit to verbalize it so that. Other people can identify it too. That, oh yeah, that's what I experienced too. Or like, ah,、oh, okay, I will try again. I will try next time. See what happens. That's that's what my、uh, experience looked like. Wow, you know that is that is very much similar to what I had experienced as well. When you know I'm not engaging with my thought. When a particular event is happening, I'm able to you know when look at the event as an event. And not a、uh, a particular truth which has happened because the truth is even much 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 more bigger. Yeah. That. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No. I, yeah. What What I was interested in, you know,、uh, do you do you follow Buddhism as well? Because we see a lot of these coming from、uh, Buddhism practice altogether, and、uh, and all these development of MBCT, everything cultivating from Buddhism or Zen. How do you see the? How do you see this correlation? Buddhism. I'm I'm not Buddhist myself. So when I teach, I'm also not teaching from Buddhism perspective. And from my own training, you know, the teacher training of MBCT, we are also not teach to、uh, to 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 any education on religious. So、um, I'm I'm not quite sure I'm the best person to talk about you know Buddhism and how is that related. <laughs> But I'm sure that's. That's very close because, like,、mm-hmm. I would join, I would join Buddhism retreat myself, even I'm not Buddhist. I enjoy that as a philosophy as well. I enjoy the Hama talk myself, but I'm not seeing as this is my religion. I'm more seeing it as this is like the philosophy that I enjoy. I'm I'm not sure if this is satisfying to your question though. No, that is that is that is per- that is perfectly fine, you know, because all the all the you know there has been a lot of hue and cry where people tend to confuse these this mindfulness with Buddhism, and in 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 reality, you know, everything even the modern science has developed from what were the religious practices, and then it evolved into becoming something. And I I believe some similarly a thing is happening with our、uh, mindfulness based sessions as well. But it is evolving. It is evolving from you know we we see a lot of meditation coming from Stoicism in Greece as well, and everything when culminating together is becoming one、uh, one key modern、uh, you know mindfulness based CT, and which is actually helping people out in the end. That's what is important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I can agree. Yeah. So now coming to the, coming to the next topic of、uh, you know、um, talking more about mind, you know. Would you could you elaborate on one of the cases, unique cases like the like the one that you spoke about, where the where the personality shift of a person had happened and it had benefited in his life? Can you do you mind to repeat your question? 
or do you mind to repeat what you just said? Sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, because being in my hometown, there's a lot of outside noise. So I'm muting myself again. <laughs> okay. Please yeah, don't mind. Okay. And there are a lot of kids here. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. the, the question I wanted to ask is, uh, my listeners would like to, if my listener goes to an MBCT, you know, what are the benefits of an MBCT? Or there are certain mm -hmm. examples that you could uh, give yeah, us yeah. that have changed the life of uh, one of your patients, yeah. maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, yeah, I teach lots of MBCT class to the public and corporations and students in school. And so I think my my students are quite coming from all walks of life. And um, I often have this kind of student I often have with someone with sleep problem. Sometimes they are referred by psychiatrists. So they come like one of my uh, students is she has um she has the higher doses of the hypnotic that she's taking. So the psychiatrist refer her to the class, hoping she can manage her sleep without adding more drugs. And after eight weeks, she's actually reducing it. So it's definitely exceeds her, her expectation. So that, that is quite common, you know, sleep disturbance in our modern society, it's chronic stress for life. Um, other examples, like I have a, uh, participants who has migraine for a long time. She's like 50 something. And she, I didn't know to begin with that she has migraine. She doesn't tell me about that. But she joined in the class. And then, like in the middle of it, I realized, oh, she can't read. So <laughs> I didn't even know the notes that I'm distributing to her that she actually can't read it. So it's like in the, in the middle of the class, I find out. But she's really diligent. She is uh, really into the practice, practice every day. After the class could come to me, she tell me that she has migraine for 30 years. Every month, she has to take drugs for a few days, and that will make her vomit, and she can't go to work. But after the class, she told me that it's coming like every two months. And she's not taking drugs anymore because she's trying to meditate with the pain. And nice. that is really impressed. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that really impressed me. I, I'm, so, I'm still feeling that you know, I admire her courage to apply mindfulness. So something so challenging in her daily life and her openness to experiment with it itself you know and uh, it's really helping her and so mm -hmm. that's one of the very impressed impressed um, um experience that i i have heard about and it also made me reflect on it you know like how how education training us to be in our brain right how how hard we're trying to learn to read to analyze to write mm -hmm. and for a lady who can't read, and doesn't mean she can't benefit from it. You know, she practice. She has her own experience. Even she may not be the best person to verbalize her own experience in the class. And the effect is still there. You know, there's a different way of knowing, not just intellectually, not just verbally. Your experience, how do you feel about sense and your body sensations, they are all a way of knowing. You know, it, it's, it's actually quite reflective to myself, you know, that yes, all the yeah, definitely, yeah, it's, it's, definitely, and it's it's quite touching. You know, all your expression that I see here, you know, it's it's coming out really. You know, it's very touching stories that you're telling. That I can completely guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> I can keep I can be talking on stop about what you <laughs> tell me about. <laughs> The the next thing you know that I am personally really interested in you know, uh, the are, are you also trained in MBSR? Uh, I took the class myself, but I was not trained as a teacher. Okay, yeah. and so you know you need official degrees to teach MBCT, but not MBSR, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So and and what's the key difference between MBSR and MBCT? To, to my knowledge, they are like 80% the same. Mm -hmm. So like most of the accents are the same. But MBCT is more structured because it's, it's borrowed from MBSR by three clinical psychologists. Designing with a purpose in their mind is to reduce the depression's relapse prevention. Mm -hmm. So it's to prevent the depressed patient to relapse. So they make the class really structured and they have cognitive exercise inside it, which is really focused on emotions um, or 
you can say psychoeducation about depression. So they have that element which MBCT doesn't, MBSR doesn't have. But MBSR have stress reaction information there, which mm -hmm. MBCT doesn't cover. Most of their practice is the same. Um, MBSR has a little bit more emphasis on loving kindness. Compared okay. to MBCT, we don't we don't practice loving kindness meditation directly, but MBSR they practice that too. So um, the variation is is like yeah, to my knowledge, just like twenty percent of it. But the delivery is a little different. I would say the the structure of MBCT is more depend that design around mood issues. Okay. And yeah. you know, if 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 one of our listeners wanted to you know experience MBSR, or you know maybe take a training on MBSR and everything, where what what is the best place they should go to? You mean in Hong Kong? <laughs> you mean in worldwide? No, like in in an online forum maybe. Ah, you mean um, taking MBSR course? Yes. In um. I'm sure you search online is easy, like the School of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. like um, like Oxford Mindfulness Center, like the University of Bangor, and like the Brown University in the US, like Canada, the Mindfulness, uh, the Center for Mindfulness Studies. They are institutions that I know that I'm sure they have online class right now because of the virus condition. Right. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they can easily find it. Um, in Hong in Hong Kong is a different story though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, if coming to this, this is gonna be a really you know you might you know call it a funny question, but uh, imagine a scenario in which the the everyone in the whole world becomes mindful of their actions. You know, mm. how do you think that world would look like? Well, I really don't know. Yeah, I really don't know. To be honest, I really don't know. This, I, it, but you, you remind me, this question remind me about um, John Campesin has actually extended the definition of mindfulness after, after, uh, after many years. So first the um, definition is very operational, like mindfulness is paying attention in a particular time, non-judgmentally, um, um, here and now, you know, like very technical, operational. And then he he adds something at the back later, saying that with kindness and wisdom, something like that. So mm -hmm. I think it's like more focused on like when the mad, mad mindfulness phenomenon spread out all over the world. You know, like everyone is talking about right. mindfulness. So there's more discussion like can can people be mindful for killing someone? Can people be mindful but doing something bad? You know, selfish for their own interest, take advantage, whatever. So he's putting that sign of of mindfulness, you know, with the ideas that you it's about bringing kindness and wisdom to your life mm -hmm. as part of the definition. I think right. that that really speaks, you know, how he he orient mindfulness to the general public, and it could be misused in many ways too, <laughs> right? So yeah. So yeah, I can't. I don't know. I don't know what will happen. You know, if everyone is mindful, and how is that going to be? Yeah, so you know, very Who's this gentleman that you just quoted? Who's put this perspective? Again. Who's this gentleman that you just spoke about? He has put kindness and virtue in mindfulness. Who is this guy? It's John Cabasin. Is the father of mindfulness. ah John Cabasin. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, I yeah. know him. Yeah. yeah, he started every sure. every course and everyone that I'm interacting with. His name is coming up front where we he started yeah. the father of modern you know mindfulness based psychology and stuff that he started. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And anything else, any kind you know wise words that you would like our audience to take away, like a like a takeaway thought for them to carry at the end of this episode and they can implement in their daily life. Uh -huh. You know, just just uh -huh. just as a thought. Yeah. Um... Thanks for that. I, I, I can't say this advice, words that I'm giving, you know, probably it's like something, it's like a gift I received from someone in my mindfulness journey, and now I'm hanging it over to you, you know. For me, it's, um, I think I hope the listeners or the audience, whatever you're already practicing mindfulness or not, 
give it a try if you're not. Give it, you know, go online, search it, lots of actually free resources available, apps available. If you're an English speaker, lots of it, you know, just go for it and try it out and have a very open mind to see what comes up to you, what your experience looks like to you. And trying to be as curious as possible to see your experience. And if you are serious enough to try it, of course, take a course. <laughs> Go ahead, you know, take a course, uh, practice with a group of people. And I really look forward to more people practice mindfulness. So more people can experience different transformation in life. Superb. This was, you know, this was a fantastic interactive session with you, Beatrice. I would like to thank you again for being on the show and, you know, and uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna link I'm gonna leave your profile links to at the end of this session podcast. It's gonna be on YouTube as well, so that people can go and search you. And uh, maybe you know, if 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 we get a listener from Hong Kong, maybe they'll contact you as well to learn more about mindfulness based, you know, MBCT and stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank thanks you again for, for being on the show. Too. Yeah, Great. thank you. Thanks, Beatrice. Have a thank nice you. Day.